welcome to the Fire and Earth podcast with your hosts, Jason Mefford and Kathy Gruber. Fire and Earth, giving you the keys to unlock your limitless potential. Welcome to another edition of the Fire and Earth podcast. I'm your co-host, Jason Mefford. And I am Kathy Gruber, and I am so excited to introduce to you yet another special, amazing guest, really good friend of mine from all the way from Texas, James Hazel Rigg. Hey, James. Excited to Chair be- dance. Yay. All the way <laughs> in the heart of Texas. Texas. Right. <laughs> right. It's well, law. Yeah, we have to clap. Right? Oh, sorry. I didn't. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it, it's Picture. all right. It, it, it only applies to Texans. Oh, okay. Well, she's never mind then. So, James, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, how you got into the storytelling, what your background is, uh, that sort of thing. Sure. So, um, I'll, I'll start with currently, I'm uh, known as a, uh, a professional hypnotist. I sit in an office and help people make changes. Um, I'm also really well known for using storytelling in hypnosis because I really think of it as uh, people come to me with a bad story about their lives. Their story is either I'm a smoker and I'm trapped or uh, I I suffer so much from anxiety or whatever it is. And in a way, I help them step into a better story. Uh, For people quitting smoking, I help them step into a story of being free. And uh, we, we even sort of cast cigarettes as um, sometimes as an oppressor, sometimes as a manipulator. Um, I love telling people the story about my college roommate and his manipulative girlfriend who became his ex-girlfriend and what it took to get, get free from her. Totally made up story, by the way. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm also uh, a musician and a performer. I, uh, I perform at Renaissance festivals uh, like we were chatting about before the show. Uh, my background was that uh, as, a, as a child, I wanted to be a college professor because two of my heroes were, were literature professors. One was my father and the other was J.R.R. Tolkien. Oh. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to be like them. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I ended up getting a master's degree in English. And that taught me a lot about story and the impact that story has on people and the fact that every story really is about making a change in some way. Mm-hmm. And so I've, I've been able to apply that knowledge to recognizing uh, how stories impact people. Uh, I, I taught as an English instructor for several years. I worked a number of years in um, the, uh, the standardized testing industry, and then I realized it was sucking my soul out. So <laughs> I became a, uh, a hypnotist to help people improve their lives. Well, I, th- I think it's funny because I think, I think stories are great, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I love stories as a speaker. I mean, we, we tell stories all the time yes. right? because that, mm-hmm. it's a great way to connect to people. And I think it's interesting. I was kind of smiling when you said, you know, about the made up story about your, you know, your roommate. And because because one of my favorite quotes is, um, you know, all stories are true. Some just <laughs> actually happened. Right. And so and so what's kind of funny is it, it's not necessarily that it has to be a true story, but that it's a story that has meaning. It's a story that gets us to transform or make some sort of a change. Right. And the interesting thing is a lot of people will jump in and say, oh, no, it has to be a true story. And it's like time out just a minute. Right. Because just like you're talking about in, in hypnosis with trying to help people, we have all kinds of stories that we believe and we think are true mm-hmm. that are totally false. Exactly. They're totally false, right? So it's <laughs> yeah. like, so we might as well actually use something that our brain actually can process well. I mean, that's why people love movies and other things like that. It's because we love the story, you know? So that, that's why it's kind of interesting how you're, you're kind of combining that with hypnosis, which to me is, is kind of fascinating. Yeah. And I mean, stories are inherently hypnotic. People go into mm-hmm. a trance while they're listening to a story. In fact, one of my, my favorite words to throw around is uh, uh, spellbinding. You know, we, we talk Ooh, about, yeah. wow, they were, the audience was spellbound. And spell... Uh, we think of it as Harry Potter waves a wand and says something, but really spell uh, is an old English word. I was an, you know, old language geek. Uh, it's an old English word that, that means story. 
uh, the the Scandinavian word for a storyteller or a fiddler is Spellemann, uh, which of course is the last name of Aaron Spellman, one of the great storytellers of uh -huh. uh, L.A. and Hollywood. Um, so that idea of people being um, bound totally still and their eyes kind of glazing over and them just listening to a story is really fascinating to me from a hypnotic standpoint. But even if people don't go totally spellbound, the stories they hear make a big difference. Stories are compelling where statistics are not. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why politicians uh, brilliantly, will, rather than talking about all of the struggling single mothers out there. They say, let me tell you about Denise, who lives in Wilmington, Indiana, and she's the mother of three, and she works at the Quickie Mart or, you know, wherever it right. is. Right, it was Joe the Plumber or whatever Joe that the whole. Plumber, yep. exactly. They, they get an example, and, and of course, Joe the Plumber proved to be an actual real person, but many of these probably aren't. They're probably composites. Mm -hmm. um, but stories have that ability to compel us in a way that it, a, a blank statistic just doesn't. Right. Well, and as a speaker, you know, everyone talks about what's your signature story. And during my keynotes and during my talks, and I know, James, you, I don't know if you've seen my marketing talk at HypnoThoughts, but um, I typically talk about stress and communication. And I use personal stories from my own life. And that ended up being translated into my book because everyone was so into the stories that I was telling <laughs> to make my point. And I've had so many people come up to me and go, can I just sit around and hear you tell stories? Because they're just so fun. <laughs> and there are now just, there's, you know, there's, you get the TED stuff, but there's also story telling nights where speakers come forward and tell stories and and to me what's fascinating about this is and and I'm I mean, as a hypnotherapist as well we've had several hypnotherapists on the show we tell stories to our uh, clients to help them deal with their issues but if you look at us just as individuals we're constantly telling ourselves stories everything we're doing is we're locked in these thought forms and we're telling ourselves these stories and when i speak to 911 dispatchers one of the biggest issues with them is they don't know how the story ends they hang up the phone and they move to the next call they don't know if the kid drowned in the pool or if the woman got right. raped or if the guy had heart survived the heart attack and so they go home and they finish that story in their minds and mm. they tend to make it fatal they tend to, to fatalize that and make it to the to the absolute worst extreme and i say to them you can tell whatever story you want you don't know how it ends make up that the kid got out of the pool and is now a world-class swimmer make up, I mean, <laughs> right you can tell yourself whatever you want to and because our brain doesn't understand the difference between mm. what we're thinking about and imagining and what's actually happening your brain's like oh good well the guy started the heart attack and the wedding went on without a hitch you know we don't know um so you know this is why i think story, this is why i wanted to have you on because i think it's so helpful not only for these external exchanges and things like sales and business meetings but it's also for our own health and our own brains what story are we telling ourselves you know are we pieces of shit or are we magnificent you know this we have constant dialogue going on well exactly. i thought i thought that's interesting because i i had i when you talk about the dispatchers I never would have even gone there or thought about that, right? Mm -hmm. But how many of these stories and other things do we kind of finish ourselves, like you said? And if we finish it that the poor kid drowns in the pool, well, we have no idea if that's actually what happened or not, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so again, you can you can kind of you know make your bubble what you want it to be, right? If you if if, if you want to feel stressed, if you want to feel sad, then the poor kid drowns, right? right. If if you want to actually feel good, then it is like you said, you know, he he survives, you know, he he was in there and somehow miraculously he swims to the edge, you know, safely, and he's the new you know Michael Phelps or whatever, <laughs> right? Without the pot. <laughs> right, right. Or, or even telling a story of because they called 911 and I as the dispatcher contacted the appropriate people, they went in and rescued him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they and saved they saved a life. They saved a life and I helped save a life, mm -hmm. right, as a dispatcher. And, you know, that's the, the thing is that um, identity is really the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, when you were, when you were telling me about the whole idea of this podcast, you said it's, it's about, you know, people no longer acting small. And I, uh, I have a quote um, beautifully calligraphed on a little, little uh, uh, sign in my office that uh, my wife actually gave it to me um, for uh, Christmas a couple years ago. 
and it's it's from the poet Rumi. Mm. And it says, you are the universe in ecstatic motion. Stop acting small. Mm. And I, I reference it with a lot of my clients. I mention that kind of thing, but it's also there for me <laughs> to remind me, okay, mm -hmm. stop acting small. I'm not limited by the things that I thought were limiting me. And, and it's not even about taking a rational, hardcore approach to the world because okay yeah maybe maybe i am just me maybe i'm not the entire universe in ecstatic motion um but if i think of myself in that way i'm gonna do bigger better things mm -hmm. so the people who come to me for example um who are suffering from anxiety i point out to them that you're already using a form of hypnotic suggestion. You're already getting real results from imaginary events. You're imagining terrible things and your body is responding to it. So you're taking control of the things that normally we don't think we can control in our bodies, like our heart rate mm -hmm. and our breathing mm -hmm. and all sorts of things like that. And uh, I say, so you have a superpower. And like all superheroes, you're misusing your superpower at first because that's the origin story of most superheroes. And you have to go to an old man with a gray beard to <laughs> help you figure out how to use your power and to train you. And it's amazing the difference that makes, mm -hmm. just giving the person a new story to step into. Uh, and that's, that's something that I... I think that some of the best business leaders have picked up on. They've realized, wow, in order to inspire people, I need a story of what our company is doing. I need a story of what we're accomplishing. And likewise, when somebody goes into sales, a lot of times uh, there are stories they've told themselves because of all the old worn out stereotypes about sales um, and so they have to let go of those old stories and then really guide their client through a story of going from having a problem to accepting this solution so it's 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 really amazing to me and maybe i just have my storyteller glasses on and so i see stories yeah. everywhere <laughs> Well, no, because it, it's interesting because you bring that up and there, there has been in the last few years, a big crossover into business, right? Mm -hmm. With people talking about storytelling marketing, you know, what you talked about before, you know, is kind of that hero's journey story mm -hmm. arc that you see in, in all the movies, right? I mean, Star yeah. Wars, you know, Luke has to go to Yoda, the, you know, not gray bearded, but you know, the, <laughs> no. wise, the wise, the wise old, the wise old Obi-Wan had a gray beard. Obi-Wan did, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Obi -Wan. Yeah. Um, you know, to, to be able to learn how to do things different. And so, you know, again, there, there's like this whole marketing genre that is being developed now on how to use stories in marketing, right? So that again, people can see that hero's journey story arc, place themselves in that position and, oh, I need my Obi-Wan, I need my Yoda, and that business or that person is that wise, you know, sage who is providing the hero with what they need. And so, so the person actually can place themselves in the story as mm -hmm. the hero. If I go to my wise sage, whoever this person is, whatever they happen to be doing, then I'm going to come out triumphant on the other end as the Jedi master. Right. Yeah. And so you have started to see that carry over into business mm -hmm. um, as well. Very interesting. Very interesting. So, James, so when you go into corporations or when you work with companies and sales and things like that, what do you what do you have them do? Do you have them write stories? Do you help them craft those tales or do you find have them tap into their own stories or like what is your how do you like to work with people? So I, I like to help people identify the, the stories that they've lived because a story is edited reality. And a lot of people think, well, I haven't done anything interesting. I haven't had a great big adventure. And yet most people have. Um, I also help them to recognize that there's a vast storehouse of stories that have already happened and already been told by other people. Um, you know, one of the things there's, there's been this big movement with like the moth story hour right. and 
all of those are first person narratives and that's great. Um, I love that they're, they're going for a niche, but I think people often overlook that we have a vast storehouse of uh, myths, folk tales, fables, legends mm -hmm. that we can also tap into. Um, so then uh, I like to, to coach people on ways to craft their story and make it more compelling. How to bring out the conflict in the story uh, because every story has got to have some sort of conflict. You've got to have some sort of danger. And um, all of us have heard a bunch of stories, but not everybody's really thought about how do I create a story? How do I make it effective? Um, sometimes they haven't thought about, okay, why do we see Darth Vader before we see Luke Skywalker? Because you have to start with that problem. Mm -hmm. um, so helping people to recognize what the challenges are um, and then how to craft a story that's going to move people uh, from where they were to where you want them to be. Uh, there's of course some important tips just for making stories vivid and compelling including really simple things that again people often don't think about like appeal to all five senses. Mm -hmm. make something real and then once you've gotten into storytelling mode how do you step back a little bit to not overdo it <laughs> oh well there's that yes <laughs> well, that's, that's a very good point because there have been so many times where i've been in the middle of a conference and i'm listening to somebody and i'm sitting there and i'm going and i'll turn to the people around me there was a woman one year at, at the conference that james and i are at every year and she just just on and on and on the first like literally she had an hour to do her talk and the first she's it's now 12 minutes and then 15 minutes and then almost 20 minutes and i fi i finally wrote on my book why are you telling me this right why are, yeah. are you telling me this because you need attention because because there was no point to her story she was just rambling on about how she was manic depressive as a kid which had nothing to do with why we were there and i was getting so irritated because one she was wasting my time she was not teaching me anything and it, at that point it became verbal masturbation she was just she wanted to talk and she had court she was holding her audience and i looked around and all these people were going <laughs> and I'm like, seriously, right. you're falling for this shit? I mean, it was, so, I mean, she didn't tell us any, I finally left. Like I actually got up and left because it was, there was no point to her telling us everything she was telling us. So if you're encountering those people, how do you rein them in and, and focus them into what, why are you telling the story? Right. So, so that gets to what back in, in, uh, in college as an English major, we referred to as, as the theme or the thesis statement. Mm. Um, a real simple way of, of thinking it is to remember back when we were kids and we would hear Aesop's fables. Mm -hmm. And at the end of every Aesop's fable, they would say, and the moral of this story is. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, of course, heavy handed. It's not what our modern audiences are going to go for. But in the back of your mind, you need to think about mm. what is my goal? What's my purpose? Um, am I trying to, to get these people to accept an idea? And if so, what's that idea? Am I trying to get them to feel a particular <laughs> feeling or emotion? Um, sometimes in, in practicing storytelling, I would just say, okay, uh, it's, a, it's a hot, sunny afternoon in Texas in the summer and people are sitting outdoors. I wonder if I can tell a story that will make them shiver. Mm. So it, sometimes the goal is let's make people feel a particular thing. And uh, as somebody very wise said, people don't really remember what you said or what you did, but they remember how you made them feel, mm -hmm. right? Um, so starting with that goal, that purpose of why am I going to tell this story? What's the point I'm going to make? And letting that be your guiding star throughout the process. Hmm. Well, and I, I think it's, you know, as we've talked about this, I think a couple points that I'm, that I'm getting out of this too, right? Is obviously if you're going to tell a story, there, there must be a purpose. Mm -hmm. And so, like you said, is it, is it to try to get people to feel a certain way, mm -hmm. to believe a certain thing, but, but like we talked about a little bit before, every story has conflict in it. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think this is what's, what's funny because as I was going through and, and 
just some other research that I've done about storytelling too, which is kind of nice now that we're coming together here. But um, I, I think the person took one of the scenes from Star Wars and, and it was like seven minutes and it went through like the story arc twice in seven minutes, right? You know, because it's like every, every time something, uh, you know, good happens and you feel like, woohoo, and then it's like, oh, the other shoe's got to drop, right? And, right? and I noticed that in a movie that we watched the other night. And you could, I mean, it was kind of predictable. It was one of those kind of fun movies, but, but you knew that, you know, things had gotten good and it seemed like everything was great. Well, you know, the, the, the two lead characters had to fight again, right? Because the movie wasn't over yet. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but, but I think, you know, in, in that from, a, from our life, and the story that we're living in our life too, is I think sometimes people think I don't want there to be any struggle, any challenge, any whatever. And you know what? The story of life is there are those things, mm -hmm. right? But the real story is the triumph mm -hmm. over that, right? And so again, it's, it's, you know, we need to probably be realistic about that in our own lives as well and think of it as, as if we are in a story as well how do we want it to end? So we start telling ourselves the story ending that we want. But when you, when you brought up the, the point about, um, you know, making people on a hot summer day in Texas, right? Humid, hot, mm -hmm. they're probably out drinking iced tea, just trying to stay mm -hmm. cool, right? Mm -hmm. And can you tell a story that can make them shiver? Yes, because when you said that, it reminded me of a story I had heard before about a man who got locked in a, um, he worked in a, in a, a railroad, a railroad uh, freight yard. And so they went around at the end of the day and they were closing up all of the box cars and everything like that. And he gets locked in one. Okay. And he thinks it is a, ref it's a refrigerated unit. And so he thinks, Oh my gosh, nobody can hear me. He's yelling, he's screaming, trying to get people to open the door and let him out because my gosh, if I stay in here overnight, I'm going to die. Right. Because it's a freezer unit. I'm, I'm going to be a frozen block of ice in the morning when people come back. And so he's screaming and, and everything. And after a while, nobody's coming and he realizes he has to stay there for the night. And he actually finds some, some way to kind of like scrawl in the, in the, um, in the box car, what's going on. And he's like, I'm so cold. You know, I, I, I love my wife, you know, or kinds of things like that you would write at the end of your life. And they came back the next morning and they opened it up. And sure enough, the guy was dead. He'd frozen to death in like a 50 degree box car. Because the story that he had told himself uh -huh. was I'm dying, I'm freezing to death. And that's literally what his body did because of that story that he was putting in his head, as opposed to saying, you know, if, if it really was, let's say, you know, at minus, you know, at zero or whatever, right? If you tell yourself the story the other way, heck, you still may be alive in the morning too, right? Yep. And so it's, it's not just hearing or telling people stories, but it's also the stories I think that we're telling ourselves in our head too can have such a huge, huge impact on the way, the way that we live our life. Right. Yeah. Well, and absolutely. And, and actually, that's a really cool, that's a really cool story. But one of the things I talk about is, the, is studies where they, they looked at, um, I talk about the power of the mind and, and the mind body connection, and how our brain doesn't recognize what is real but versus what we're being told. It just assumes it's all actually happening. And they took 50 asthmatics whose trigger was cat dander. And they put them in a room and handed them blankets covered in cat dander. And they said, put this on your face. And the people did. And they needed their inhaler and an EpiPen. And they started wheezing. And at the end of the study, they realized these were clean blankets, fresh out of the package, never near a cat. <laughs> but we have this ability to convince us to change our physiology by the stories that we're telling and by what we're being told. We're very vulnerable, especially in medical stuff. If someone is what um, considered an authority figure, like a parent or a politician or a religious leader or a doctor, they put on that white coat and we assume what they say is true. Uh, oh, you've got two weeks, Mrs. Johnson, and two weeks later, boom, there, Mrs. Johnson drops dead. You know, um, the stories are very powerful. And, and I also, James, use the superhero, the uh, superpower idea too when I talk <laughs> about that. It's like, why not use your superpower for good? Uh, yeah. Not to the extent you do, but I do mention that. So, so we have about, um, we're, we're starting to wrap we do this uh, we, we these the time flies um any last thoughts james or any any tips or usable info that we can pass on to our listeners 
Sure. So you were talking about the importance of the stories that we tell ourselves, and it's important to recognize that um, you can impact the stories that other people are telling themselves. And the way you do that is by telling them a better story. Mm. Um, and uh, Winston Churchill said, if I need someone who works for me to have a particular quality, I impute it to them. In other words, he would simply expect them to have that. <laughs> and he would reflect that in his body language and in his spoken language. He might say, I need somebody really responsible and diligent to take this on, so I'm giving it to you. And it's, it's just a tiny little story about them. And then they're like, okay, well, I have to live up to this. Mm -hmm. right. And we do that in a negative way. I see parents do it in a negative way to their children far too often. And really great parents do it in a positive way. Leaders, likewise. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going into your business assuming that everybody who works for you is an idiot or dishonest, then they'll live up to that expectation. Mm -hmm. Mm. I was thinking as you were talking, James, about stories, and, and I was thinking, how does that relate to sales? And the movie Founder popped into my head, the Michael Keaton movie about McDonald's and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. he, that character lived and prospered by telling stories about the milkshake machine, about the hamburger, about, I mean, like, that's what that character did so well, was weave and tell those stories and get people involved and give them those qualities of, and now you want to buy this, don't you? Um, I mean, he was, a, he, was a, he was a master manipulator, sometimes in a good way, sometimes not in a good way. But when we right. were talking about this, that, so many of those scenes popped into my head. And I was like, that is such a great movie to me in looking at sales and telling stories and how your personality weaves into your job um so that just kind of popped in excellent i have not seen that movie i'll have to check it out oh yeah uh, yeah no it's no, yeah because it's uh ray Kroc was a very interesting man and, yeah uh you know having um yeah one of the one of the companies that i worked with um they actually developed the frozen french fry for mcdonald's so the the founder of the company knew ray Kroc very well and uh, yeah, there's some interesting stories about Ray, but that movie is actually, it's great in, in seeing, <coughs> excuse me again, you know, he kind of saw a vision. He saw a story in his head uh -huh. of what he thought could become. And McDonald's is today what it is, uh, you know, in large part because of those stories that Ray Kroc told himself and told other people uh, that made, made it into, you know, the biggest restaurant chain in the world. Um, can't remember the number right now, but there's some percentage of the world's population that eats McDonald's every day. And it's some ungodly number. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 again, it goes back to those stories. Stories can have a positive impact when we're telling the good positive stories. But like mm -hmm. you said, you know, sometimes we tell the negative stories as well. And people usually show up and do exactly what you expect them to do. So I, I love that. I love that Churchill uh, little mm -hmm. story because I didn't realize that he had actually uh, done that. But as you said that, I can totally see him like in character doing that <laughs> to somebody, right? And it's like, you know, yeah. Mr. Mefford, I need someone who is responsible. <laughs> I know you are that person. You know, kind of We're doing impersonations now. <laughs> no, not really. That, that was a bad Winston Churchill. But no, anyway. it was a very good Winston Churchill, yeah. He also um, said, going forward in the world, every baby shall look like me. He also said that. <laughs> and it came true. It did come true. <laughs> oh, my God. It did come true. Oh, my God. Okay, so let's end on every baby looking like Winston Churchill. Uh, we're running babies a couple times this time. Normally, we talk about animals. Animals. This time we talk about babies. That's fine. Um, so James, why don't you tell everybody how they can reach you, how they can learn more about, I know you have a course that you're working on, uh, how they can get in touch with you and, and hear more of your stories and sure. help themselves. So um, kind of the hub for everything that I do is a website uh, called hypnoticstorytellingcourse.com. Now I have to give, give the proviso. It's, it's the 14th of June, 2019. The course is not completely finished yet. I hope to roll it out within the next few months. However, that website also is an easy place to access my hypnotic storytelling podcast. Um, where I focus mostly on stories used for change work and especially something we didn't touch on, which is nested loop stories. Ooh, sounds very mysterious. Oh. Um, and I just give some, some examples of that. I also interview uh, some other storytellers and have them 
join us for that. So um, hypnoticstorytellingcourse.com is sort of the hub for all of that. And there's a couple of other interviews and products and a few other things there. Yeah, great. We'll have that in the show notes and we'll have that. That'll be scrolling below you as we speak. Awesome. This has been such a great, it goes so fast. We just could talk to you people for it. <laughs> uh, I know it's like suddenly boom. Uh, but this is, this has been awesome. This was a great show. Um, I am Kathy Groover. I can be reached at kathygroover.com. And I'm Jason Mefford. I can be reached at jasonmefford.com. So go out there, tell good stories to yourself and to others, right? So we can make this place a better place and you can actually live the dreams that you have in your stories. And we'll see you on a future episode of the Fire and Earth Podcast. Yeah. Bye. Bye.